Hi, everybody. Welcome to the UW Computer Science Colloquium. It's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Sid Srinivasa. Um, Sid is visiting from Carnegie Mellon University. He got his PhD from CMU in 2005 and uh, then joined the Intel Research Lab in Pittsburgh, which was actually kind of the sister lab to the Intel lab we had here in Seattle. And um, already in that lab, he established a, a very strong uh, robot uh, research group. So when they decided in 2010 or 2011, when they decided to shut down all the labs, it was actually pretty easy for Sid just to cross the street and become faculty at CMU where he's uh, still faculty right now. Sid's research is in the broad area of robot uh, manipulation, where he's looking at a broad set of different areas. So he's looking at, for example, how can we do path planning in high dimensional state spaces, for example, mani for manipulation. How can a robot pick up objects? How can it move objects? Um, also related to computer vision techniques, how can it recognize objects? And uh, an important area of his research is also human-robot interaction, like how can human and people do collaboration uh, together. And you might remember Anka Dragan. She gave a talk here two years ago on her excellent work that she did on human-robot interaction, and that was advised by, by Sid. Um, and what I think is also very exciting about his research is really that he's not just looking at these small technical aspects of certain robotics problems that he's really looking at the whole system aspects, where it's about how you bring all of this together to get robots to solve, let's say, real world problems. And uh, he's looking at application domains such as uh, the health robotics and helping elderly people with his, the robots that he's building. So welcome, Sid. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dieter. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here spe speaking to such a distinguished audience. It's nice to see some familiar faces. It's also really nice to see some, some new faces. Uh, so I'm Sid, uh, like uh, Dieter mentioned, I'm a professor at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I've, I've known Dieter since, uh, for a very long time, and I've always been very um, impressed by his work, his, even his earlier work on uh, trying to get robots out there in the real world. Um, some of his earlier work with, uh, with Wolfram Burgard and Sebastian Thrun uh, really is an inspiration for me uh, for building systems that not, not only have strong theoretical properties, but also are practically useful and relevant. So hopefully you'll see a, a, a little bit of the vein of what, the kind of research that I like doing in this talk today. Uh, before I begin, I want to uh, acknowledge my fantastic lab. Uh, this is, um, I have uh, many, many students, some of whom uh, you may know already, uh, some of whom are here, like Aaron, and Nathan, I think I saw Nathan. Uh, I, um, but really, each one of these students has a story to tell, and I'm merely a vehicle for their stories. And today, I'll tell you one or two of those stories, uh, but there's so many more stories that uh, if you come find me anytime, I'd be happy to talk to you about. But uh, it's been a fantastic pleasure to work with a, a great group of students at the Personal Robotics Lab. So if there's sort of one thing that I do, it's manipulation. Uh, my goal is to get robots to physically, forcefully interact with the world pick up objects, clear tables, diffuse bombs, diffuse bombs underwater. Uh, those are some of the projects that we've been looking at, but really doing whatever it takes to solve the manipulation problem. Um, let me give you an example of one very important manipulation problem that we looked at, uh, which is uh, separating the cookie from the cream of an Oreo. Uh, this is actually uh, an, an ad that we shot for, for Oreo. Uh, the interesting story here is that they, this is my robot, Herb, by the way, uh, and it's going to hopefully pick up that, uh, that Oreo rather daintily and manipulate it. Uh, one thing I want you to know is that this system is completely autonomous. So oh, we got a call from Oreo about two weeks before this, we shot this, and we decided that we would uh, build algorithms for detecting, recognizing, and registering Oreos. Uh, build compliant controllers that would manipulate deformable objects. Uh, we actually had a little bit of a learning phase. The Oreos are all very, very different from each other. Uh, and we did all of this. And I think one of the things that's really cool, apart from the fact that we separated the cookie from the cream, when we started this project, we had no idea that we would be uh, working with Oreos. Oreos were actually some of the most delicate objects that we had ever worked with. But the fundamental building blocks of perception of manipulation of machine learning that we had developed sort of generalized to all of these. And we were able to do this, this demo. Uh, it was also a lot of fun. And, and I think it's also indicative of how much we've progressed uh, building systems and getting robots to work. Uh, just as um, 
uh, sort of truth in advertising, Herb is able to separate the cookie from the cream about three out of 10 times totally. Uh, I ran a, a, a very legitimate user study with my four-year-old son, and uh, he separated the cookie from the cream about four out of 10 times. Uh, the other nice thing about separating Oreos is that the, the outcome is very delicious, and you can, you can eat them. You, you tend to get a little fat. Today, I'll talk a little bit about some of the algorithms that go into these kinds of problems, as well as several other problems. So one question you might ask is, why is this hard? Uh, you know, 20 years ago, or how many, many years ago, we had uh, Deep Blue beating uh, Gary Kasparov at chess. And clearly, here was the, the smartest human in the world, and he was uh, getting beaten at a game that we humans developed. Uh, and, uh, and he was getting beaten by a computer, by a robot. And, and I think uh, this, this particular picture is very iconic because uh, you know, it, it inspired little Sid to write my own little computer chess playing algorithms. They were terrible, uh, and anybody could beat them. But really, it showed us that algorithms had come a long way. I think the other piece that's really interesting to me, and maybe it's interesting only to me, is that here's this robot that's sort of the smartest robot in the world that can beat the world's best chess player, and yet it needs a human to move its chess pieces. And, and maybe, just maybe, the, the hardest thing about playing chess is not thinking several moves ahead, but maybe it is about picking up those chess pieces and moving them. That's a very biased view I have because I work on picking up stuff. But I think there's a, there's a fundamental truth here, which is we're, we're, what we're trying to do, and a lot of what my work is trying to do, is to bring about uh, a reconciliation between these two fields, right? Uh, bring about a reconciliation between what robots are really, really good at, which is sort of geometric search in, in fairly structured environments. Robots can search way better than we can. Uh, you know, you can search for anything on Google in less than 200 milliseconds. Uh, but to reconcile that with the messy, dirty, real world that we live in, with physics, with contacts, with mechanics, with forces and torques, really, is to try and build algorithms that can sort of bridge these two worlds, such that we have robots that are not just playing chess out in the simulated world, but actually playing chess in the real world. And so today, I'll talk a little bit about some of our work in sort of bringing about this reconciliation. And you know, as Dieter mentioned, a lot of my focus recently has been not just about manipulation, but really manipulation with and around people. Um, and part of the motivation was that if you're trying to get robots to work in human environments, like if you want to get Rosie the robot to work in your home, or if you're looking at assistive care scenarios, then one of the things that you see quite a bit in human environments are humans. right? And I think it's really important to think about how you might be able to model humans such that you can work closely with them. Right? If you think about the way uh, you make breakfast in a, uh, you know, in a kitchen with somebody else, the making breakfast is a, is a delicate dance. It's a dance between two people of predicting each other's intentions, predicting what your goals are, what your behaviors are, and actually changing and modifying your own behavior such that you can, you can react to it accordingly. And I'd like to enable robots to participate in this wonderful and delicate dance that, that happens every day when you work with and around people. And, and I think, uh, you know, when, when I am mostly inspired. This is Jacques Pepin, who is a, is a famous uh, chef who I, who I really love. And I watch all of his cooking shows, and I love to cook. And, and I would love to have a robot that can work effortlessly you know, with and around people, like, like Jacques works with his daughter. Um, and, and I think it's, it's really, really complicated, right? It's not just about treating humans as obstacles to be avoided, but it's really thinking about how you can work with and around people, predicting their behavior, predicting their emotions and their intentions. And today, I'll talk a little bit also about some of our work on formalizing mathematical models for human-robot collaboration and how we're using them for shared autonomy. So I think when you, when you put this together, you get um, what we believe is another reconciliation. This is sort of reconciling uh, the wonderful work that's been done in sort of human-robot collaboration, the qualitative work on being able to understand human intentions with the more mathematical world of optimal control. So treating humans as stochastic optimal controllers, building prediction algorithms, and bringing, building control algorithms that can actually work with them. And just like we want to 
build and model physics-based manipulation as search, I'd like, ideally like to be able to model human-robot collaboration as sort of optimal control and bring about another reconciliation. So this sort of fundamentally encapsulates the things I like to do. Uh, I like to build uh, mathematical models for physical phenomena, whether it is physics or whether it is human-robot collaboration, and really trying to understand what we can fundamentally do. So today, I'll give you one vi vignette each into these stories. When you're able to do that, uh, you can do sort of fun things like this. This is some of our work on deception. Uh, we were trying to build a mathematical model for deceptive behavior. So here at our robot, uh, we asked our participant to guess which, which bottle the, the robot was going to go after, and she picked one early, whereas the robot was actually trying to deceive her. And you can actually write out deception as having a posterior distribution over the probabilities of the objects that you're going after and building a model that actually maximizes entropy. So it's maximizing your uh, uncertainty about which object it's going after, for example. This is kind of cool because we were able to take this sort of very qualitative idea of like, I want to deceive you. I don't know why I might want to do that, but it's kind of cool. Uh, and, and try to build a mathematical model around how that could be formalized and put it into an optimal control algorithm. So that's what I'll talk about today, manipulation with and around people. I'll start off by talking a little bit about the first part of it, which is manipulation. And, and like Dieter mentioned, uh, the flavor of manipulation that I really care about, I've been looking at a lot, is what we call physics-based manipulation. And just sort of to give you a little bit of context, uh, robots are fantastic at manipulation, right? Robots are really, really good at manipulating objects, so then why am I doing any research on them? Uh, robots build our cars faster and better than we can in factory floors, so clearly they're doing something very, very well. But I think if you think about the paradigm in a factory floor, then it follows what's called sort of pick and place. You pick something up and you place it somewhere else. Also, the factory floor has been designed for a robot as our homes have been designed for us as humans. So I think if you want to get robots out of the factory floors and into people's homes, you can sort of do one of two things. You can either try to turn your home into a factory floor, which I know I have two young kids, and that's like really impossible as much as my wife tries. Um, or you can try to develop algorithms that can enable robots to work under the clutter and uncertainty that's present in human environments. Right? So we work effortlessly under a lot of clutter and a lot of uncertainty, and I'd like to enable robots to be able to do the same thing. So when, when we started doing this, uh, this is actually a video of some of the work that we're doing that we did back in the day with the DARPA ARM project. Uh, so here is an example of a completely hand-coded motion. So we coded all of this by hand, where the robot sort of wasn't able to reach that rock and it curled it into its arms, right? So this is what's called a, a non-prehensile manipulation action. Non-prehensile means that you're not grabbing the object with a, with a firm grip, which means that you're pushing it or pulling it or sliding it or toppling it. This was really, really useful because it allowed this robot to be able to pull something into its reach, right? This is an object that was not graspable before and it was able to pull it into its reach. The other thing that this motion was able to do was that it reduced uncertainty. By enveloping an object and sort of bringing it close towards you, you're funneling all the uncertainty about the object and reducing it to a, a smaller state than there was before. And the question that we asked was, how can we formalize this, right? How can we let an algorithm automatically figure these things out? And the fundamental idea here is that we'd like to be able to harness the mechanics of manipulation, harness the, the process that we use for pushing objects to reduce uncertainty. We do this every day. When you pick up the, the Coke can or the bottle in front of you, you're sort of curling your hand around it to grasp it. And then fundamentally what you're doing is that you're taking this sort of cloud of uncertainty and collapsing it down to a much smaller state, right? So you're running an open loop stable action. Essentially it's, a, it's an action that reduces uncertainty without necessarily needing much feedback. And so we were able to do this. Um, and fundamentally the idea is that to be able to model non-prehensile manipulation, you need to have a model of physics. Um, the, my sort of flavor of model of physics that I love using is quasi-static pushing. This comes from about 40 years of physics literature. But the fundamental idea here, uh, assumption about quasi-static pushing, is that the object stops moving as soon as you stop pushing it. So you can experiment with all the objects in front of you and see how many of them 
satisfy or, va or violate quasi-static pushing, like this object, that's rigidly attached. Uh, this one sort of stops moving as soon as I stop pushing it. But there are a lot of objects that violate this, right? So if you take a ball that's rolling on a table, then it's not going to stop moving as soon as you stop pushing it. So quasi-static pushing has its advantages and its limitations. One of the main advantages of quasi-static pushing is that there's an order one solution to the forward dynamics problem. You can analytically solve the forward dynamics problem in order one. You can compute analytical solutions to it, which is remarkable because, you know, Physics itself is a hydrodynamical system, is non-contact relationships, there's Coulomb friction, but for this one small instance of, quasi, of quasi-static pushing, you can actually solve the forward model analytically. And once you can solve the forward model, you can actually compute these analytical capture regions. So this little sort of arrowhead shape is the set of all poses of the object that you know will guaranteeably get the object into the palm of the hand. And this are all just computed analytically because we have a known forward model, which means that, and this is sort of the three-dimensional rendering of that for a 3D object in x, y, theta, which means that any time this object is within that particular three-dimensional surface, which has an analytical representation, the object is guaranteed to be pushed into your hand, right? So we've analytically computed the capture region, the basin of attraction of this open-loop stable action, which is, which is kind of cool. And so whenever there's any uncertainty, what you can do is your perception system tells you a reported pose, you have some uncertainty around it, and the game you're playing is trying to find the smallest capture region that encompasses your uncertainty region, right? So you're trying to find the smallest net that you can throw on top of the object such that all of its uncertainty is captured. And you can do this analytically. One of the outcomes of being able to do that is our motions like this. So this is completely autonomously generated. The robot figured out how to shape its fingers into a funnel such that the uncertainty of that lug nut that it's trying to grasp will be funneled into its fingertips such that it can grasp it. This is, uh, for any of you familiar with the DARPA RMS program, this is the infamous lug nut that no one was able to grasp, including us, uh, until we came up with, uh, the, our algorithm came up with this solution. This is one of the few instances where an algorithm is better, was better than sort of human intuition in being able to solve the problem. But this is kind of cool, right? Because what it's able to do is to use its effectors, use its environment in such a way that it's able to create these funnels that are able to reduce uncertainty to a state where you can actually grasp it. And this, this strategy actually works remarkably well. So we were really happy with it, and it, it worked really well. But um, I want to first talk about limitations, right? Every time you talk about a research problem, you should then immediately talk about all the things that are wrong with it. Uh, so it, in terms of its limitations, and there's actually a lot of work that followed after, after us that tried to uh, take these models. One of the main limitations is that we're essentially only dealing with sort of single object interaction. We're, we're trying to push grasp a particular object into our goal, and that's, that's sort of limited fundamentally. Uh, oftentimes, you may want to interact with multiple objects. The other thing is that the contact is limited to the end effector. Uh, you know, this is kind of funny because most times when you work with robots, you always think there's a hand and then there's the arm. The goal of the arm is to get you to interesting places, and the goal of the hand is to grab stuff, right? And you might think humans, well, we do the same thing, right? But think of all the times when you had your arms full of stuff and you've tried to open a door, right? You use all of your body, your whole arm, the rest of your body to manipulate. So really, I think one interesting paradigm with non-prehensile manipulation where you don't have to grab the object is that you can use your entire body as a manipulator. You can push, pull, slide, kick with your hands, with your feet, with your body, with your waist, whatever you want, right? So really, one of the things we wanted to do was to generalize contact to not just to the end effector, but to the entire arm itself. And then finally, um, you know, we had these carefully coded motion primitives, right? We told the robot that it, had a, it could push the object into its hand and it could reshape itself. Even though it produced some very expressive motion, it was still sort of carefully coded by us. Like, I want to be the first to admit that we gave it the parameter space to play with. Ideally, what I'd like to be able to do is for the robot to have its entire configuration space to play with and to figure out what kind of motion to produce to grasp the object, not to be uh, sort of constrained to these carefully coded motion primitives, right? And uh, we did it. Uh, here's uh, an example of our new algorithm in action, and I'll talk about this algorithm. 
All this algorithm knows is that that white object, white box there, has to be moved to its target. And it is told that everything in its environment, everything in its environment, uh, all those objects over there are movable. And what it's doing there is here is kind of fun because it's cradling the object in its elbow and moving it forward because it knows the consequences of its actions. So it knows it has a goal object, a goal region, and a set of all of these movable objects. And it's producing these open loop stable actions that use its entire arm to be able to reconfigure clutter, right? This is kind of how when I tell my son to clear the table, he sort of goes in a rampage and does things like this. But it's, it's really cool to see that we can actually take physics and actually extend it to these sort of much higher dimensional spaces. And a lot of emergent behavior comes out of it, right? Like we never told the robot to grab stuff with its elbow. It was able to figure that out automatically. So let me try to formalize this and we'll sort of go through the discovery process of coming up with this algorithm. So we, we, we invented what's called the rearrangement planning problem. In the rearrangement planning problem, you have a robot. Um, you have a set of obstacles that you know are immovable. So you tag certain parts of the world as immovable, like this guy. You can't move it. And there's a certain other set of objects that we call movable objects. Movable objects are things that you can move. And there's some physics model underlying that allows you to move them, right? And you know that physics model. And your goal is to push the object to a goal region. I have the target object that I care about, and I'd like to push it to a goal region. I have to get the object from start to goal. It's a little bit like going through a maze, but being able to reconfigure the walls of the maze as you're going through them. Right? You can not only go through the maze, which is what you would do if you wanted to avoid all the objects, but hey, you can move some walls around if you wanted, which is what you'd be able to do if you push these objects around. So sort of keep that mental picture in your mind. Of, of trying to do that. Uh, we work with the cross product state space of, all, of the robot and all the movable objects. So we're planning in the full dimensional state space of the, of the robot and every object that's out there. Of course, our action space is limited uh, in that our action space is only the set of controls that the robot can exert, right? The uh, movable objects don't have jetpacks on them that will allow them to move by themselves. We're bounded by these lower dimensional control actions that we can take, and that the movable objects can only be moved when we contact them. And they, ha and they are beholden to the laws of physics. Right? This x dot equals f of xa is sort of generalized laws of physics, but we're using um, you know, sort of Newtonian physics and quasi-static motion. So the game you're playing is that you'd like to be able to plan in this much, much higher dimensional space with these much, much lower dimensional control actions that you have of sort of the joint angles that you can move. And you, you're also constrained by the fact that physics only lets you to move in certain ways, right? So you can only roll out your actions in certain, in certain fixed ways. And these physics rules are given by sort of our non-prehensile interaction. Um, so one of the big challenges that we've faced is to sort of incorporate whole arm, non-prehensile interaction with multiple objects, right? I promised you that we'd be able to move any object we want, maybe multiple objects with the entire arm, right? We'd love to be able to do that. How do we actually enable that? And the sort of insight is actually uh, interesting in that we, what we wanted to do was instead of sort of planning with these very carefully coded primitives, we asked the question, can we integrate physics into the very heart of motion planning algorithms. You know, you have these motion planning algorithms like A star or randomized planners that I'll talk about, but can we embed into them this notion of physics? Can we tell the robot, not only can you arbitrarily transition state, but here's the physics that lets you figure out how to transition that state, right? Can we do that in the very, very core? And this is where having an order one expansion of physics is really, really important. We'd like to be able to run physics rollouts tens of thousands of times, right? And if you had a physics simulator, a black box physics simulator that you're using, planning would take tens of seconds or hundreds of seconds, right? So the, what the rollout gives us, the order one rollout gives us is the tractability to be able to roll out tens of thousands of hypotheses very, very, very quickly. And so um, here's how sort of a, a randomized search algorithm or even sort of uh, asynchronous dynamic programming essentially works is that you're growing uh, a tree. You're growing a tree from the start, and you're exploring several leaf nodes. This is how, for example, an algorithm like Monte Carlo Tree Search works. And at every point, what you, and every dot in there is a, is a vertex, a configuration, which is a particular configuration not just of the robot, but also of all of the objects. I have some, and every edge there is a particular action that I take that's rolled out by physics, right? Um, I have some target that I'd like to attain. Imagine I'd like to be able to 
grow this tree towards this particular target, and that is some other pose of the object. And I, the algorithm requires two things. One is a nearest neighbor, which is actually a very interesting and hard problem, which tells you which point on the tree to grow from. So you'd like to find a candidate on your tree to grow out of. And we actually use the machine learning algorithms to learn a, a good distance metric in this cross-product high-dimensional space. Because you're dealing with spaces that involve products of uh, SON as well as um, R3, as well as the configuration space of the robot. And, and actually figuring out what the nearest neighbors are that are relevant for manipulation is actually fairly challenging. Once you find your nearest neighbor, you'd like to be able to target this particular point. right? And this is actually a standard control problem called a shooting method. Uh, what you end up doing, since you don't have a solution to the two-point boundary value problem in that you can't analytically solve for a particular target you'd like to get to, what you end up doing is throwing a bunch of trajectories out and seeing which one sticks. So essentially, you're throwing darts at the target and seeing which, comes to, which one comes the closest. And so if you end up doing that, you end up throwing all of these darts out. And these are all various physics rollouts. And we do a lot of learning to um, optimize these. One is using trajectory optimization algorithms to actually guide the search. So every time you roll something out, you know you get, two ans you get one answer, which is how far away did your target, uh, did your rollout get you to the target? So let's say I threw a dart, and I saw that I missed my, my, my bullseye by five centimeters. This can actually tell me how to throw the next dart, right? So I know that I'm a stochastic optimal controller, because that's who I am when I'm throwing darts. And then I throw something out, and I miss it. And now I turn my angle by a little bit. It's like playing like you know, bananas or gorillas or whatever games that you played when you were young uh, on, on video games. And so you're, you're changing your angle of attack such that you're able to get closer. So this is a stochastic optimization algorithm that goes on. And then you pick the guy that came the closest, and then you just keep doing this. In the end, when you get to your target, or when you get to your target region, you can walk this tree back to the start, and you end up with a plan that looks like this. So this is a plan that the system came up with, uh, where it's going to push various objects around, because it has full rollouts of the, of the world, and then move the target object to the goal. Um, one of the interesting things here that I'm not talking about is that if you're trying to optimize for the motion of the robot, then you end up having to spend an incredible amount of time planning in the search space. right? So what we do is we come up with what are called anytime algorithms, which essentially trade off optimality for speed. So anytime the robot, the, you ask me for an answer, I'm going to give you an answer. If you ask me for an answer in two seconds, I'm going to give you a kind of crappy answer. If you ask me for a, an answer in five seconds, I'm going to give you a much better answer. So at every point, uh, what our system is doing is that it's constantly sort of branch and bonding its solutions such that it give you a solution quickly that is suboptimal and then get better over time. Right? So that's, what, that's the solution that you saw there. So that was, that was great. We were able to incorporate sort of whole arm non prehensile interactions. The next challenge was to try and see how we could speed this up. So, yes, question. Code a priori, sort of how big your moves are. You know, is it a centimeter at a time? Is it a foot at a time? I mean, is that something the the, the algorithm tries to reason about online? Uh, that's a great question. So the question was, how do you decide on the durations of your control actions? Um, so uh, there are some reasonably formal ways of doing that. Uh, based on the controllability of the system. If one, one common mistake that people do is to decide on a fixed time, t, and then roll out based on that, you can prove that then it's possible with probability one not to actually get your optimal, uh, not to get to a solution. What we end up doing actually is a combination of, we look at the local controllability of the system, like how peaky is the system, and then we decide rollouts based on that. Uh, so we stochastically vary the rollout times based on where we see how linearish we see the system to be. Um, but yeah, that's that's another sort of one of those hidden things that uh, we, we we rarely get to talk about. But we've written sort of three fourths of a paper just to decide on on how to figure out what the rollout time should be. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so the other uh, big challenge is that you know I told you this glorious future of like planning with the entire robot space, doing all of those things in, in full dimensional space. The sad truth about it is that it's hard. Um, and, and although, ideally, you would like to be able to push things around, grab them, throw them up in the air, grab this other object, put it to the destination, grab it, and put it down, 
Um, one of the challenges is in sort of maintaining tractability, right? Because there's a combinatorial explosion of the number of things, operations that you can perform in your world, and you'd like to be able to sort of um, maintain uh, some sort of efficiency when you're planning these. So one trick that we do, which is actually quite reasonable, is that we project our actions onto a lower dimensional, what we call physics manifold. So we commit to the fact that everything that happens happens on the table, right? So we prevent our robot from performing any motions that would get objects out of the table. We can only sort of slide objects around on the table. Imagine there's an invisible barrier that prevents you from like nudging an object above the table or lifting the arm and sticking it somewhere else. And then we plan in that lower dimensional manifold. So we lose completeness, right? We're, we're restricting ourselves to a lower dimensional subspace. Bad news, bad, bad. But what we gain is an efficiency. We're able to produce plants that are much more efficient. So we restrict ourselves to plants that look like this. So here, this robot could have uh, lifted its arm and moved and moved certain objects around, but we're projecting everything back onto SE2, which is the plane of the object, right? So every time we run a rollout, we're not letting it explore beyond the physics manifold that we're constraining it to. So we're projecting physics back down onto this uh, lower dimensional manifold. So essentially, even though we're pl planning in the full robot configuration space, we're projecting every rollout onto SE2. Right? We're still maintaining the null space, which means that the robot can move, has infinitely many ways of going from one place to another uh, on the plane, but we are restricting it, to, restricting it to be on the plane. So when we do all of this, this is sort of the video played back just so that you get more intuition on what's going on. You notice that the hand sort of never departs the plane of the, plane of the table. That's because we told it to project it down onto that manifold. And it has full physics, right? So even within that physics manifold, it's able to, to do everything that, that we said it would be able to do. Um, we did some more fun stuff. So you can do things like this, where the robot can deliberately push objects aside such that it can get the, get the target object from start to go. This is actually another kind of fun use of non-prehensile manipulation, is that you can manipulate things that are bigger than your hand. Like that is an object that my robot's hand could not pick up, but that doesn't mean that it can't manipulate it. We manipulate things every day that are bigger than what we can pick up, right? And so that's, that's, a, that's another sort of side advantage of non-prehensile manipulation. Another big advantage is that you can manipulate even when you don't have hands. Question, oh, I had this big punchline, and then you, okay, go ahead. <laughs> other objects should not fall down or something? I mean, why even care about the other objects? Why oh, that's a, that's a great question. Yes, yes. Uh, this is like, again, this is what my son often asks me. Like, why, why are you annoyed that I pushed all the objects out of the, out of the table when you asked me to just clear the table? Yes, so we can add physics constraints. So we can add constraints saying, we can actually add a variety of constraints, right? So one of the constraints we can add is that you're not allowed to push stuff out of the table. Uh, other constraints we can add are the the sensitivity of the way we interact with individual objects. Let's assume that one of those objects is a wine glass, and the other object is you know, one of these Amazon boxes. right? The way you interact with the wine glass, you may only want a particular kind of velocity twist applied to the wine glass, whereas you might be more free with the velocity twist that you apply to, to the Amazon box. So we can add all of those constraints in the rollouts. Yep. Can I constrain things to not move? Absolutely, yep. Uh, not only can we constrain things to not move, we can also constrain the chaining of objects that we use to push something. So uh, what our algorithm will do is that if it needs to move three objects, it'll grab the first one, push it against the second one, and push it against the third one, create this sort of chain of objects and push them all out. Uh, and you can say, you know what, I don't like three wine glasses being pushed together because they may topple, right? So you can certainly do that. Um, so uh, you can manipulate objects even when you don't have any hands. So uh, we work with NASA. So this is the NASA um, um, Mars rover. And uh, one of the things that uh, they wanted to do was to allow rovers like this to reconfigure the terrain of Mars such that they would allow for easier traversal. Fundamentally, every time you look at a mobile robot navigation problem, you say, here's my terrain, here's an obstacle cost map that I create, and I want you to stay away from crevasses and things that you want to fall through. 
our thesis was, if I have a big ditch that my robot can't go over, why don't I roll a rock into that ditch and climb over that rock? Why don't I, re just like we were able to reconfigure the walls of the maze, just like we were able to reconfigure objects, why don't we reconfigure terrain such that we can actually go over it? Um, and so we, we didn't implement something that, that crazy, but we actually implemented our algorithms on the rover. So here, um, What's interesting here is that this robot has no hands, uh, and this robot is trying to manipulate these objects. All we told uh, uh, the system was you have to move these objects to a, a target location. But this is another great example of how when you have non-prehensile actions, uh, you can actually move things even when you don't have hands. And it's kind of funny that every time I look at this, I think, oh, wow, it like cradled the object between its two tires. But again, all of that just emerged from the physics that we gave the system, right? So it's able to use its physics to actually move objects around that it's, it won't be able to move otherwise. And it's pushing various blocks around by itself. This video is actually kind of cool. The next one, um, let's see if I can play it. Yep. Because this one's kind of easy. Uh, we told the system to clear the box from that region. So not only can you give positive gold regions, you can also give negative gold regions easily. You say, I don't want stuff anywhere. This video is kind of fun and bizarre. We told the system to clear both of those boxes, and the robot did this. Um, so it starts off, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to anthropomorphize the robot and try to tell you what it's thinking. You think it's trying to move that box and move the other one out of the way, but it actually picks it up and uses it to push the other box out of the way. Um, I'm not saying this is the right thing to do, <laughs> but uh, you know, this is what our planner decided to do, which is kind of, kind of fun and interesting. Um, but I want to talk about a limitation, because I promise you I'll talk about limitations. Um, so uh, the world that we've looked at uh, is sort of uh, misleadingly clean, right? There's a question, yes. Um, are the trajectories uh, executed uh, without feedback? Or... That's a great question. I'll come to that in a second. But yes, this is all open loop, open loop uh, actions. They're all executed open loop. I'll talk a little bit about how we close the loop in a second. Um, yes, that's a great question. So um, to answer that question, we've assumed that we have a world that's perfect and beautiful that's given to us, and then we pr produce these sort of non-prehensile interactions. But really, the world looks like this. Right? There's uncertainty in the pose of the objects that you care about. There's uncertainty in your physics. There's uncertainty in your control authority. So how do you make sure that your plans, that you're executing open loop, are stable if you don't model any of that uncertainty? Um, and ideally, we'd like to reformulate this problem and say that really what I'd like to be able to do is to push the object into the goal region with high probability. Right? I have a belief distribution that I start off with. This belief distribution is in the cross product space. And I'd like to end up with a goal belief distribution where the target object has a peaked belief over the goal that it cares about. Right? So really what we'd like to be able to do is lift this into a space where we can actually deal with uncertainty. So we've done a few things to deal with that. One of them is some really interesting work that my postdoc, Aaron Johnson, did uh, on being able to define what we call path divergence. So here is an example. So we have six different trajectories overlaid on top of each other executing a single action. So you see six different arms overlaid on top of each other and six different blocks. And you notice that this action is really, really susceptible to changes in the object pose because three of those blocks are sort of left behind while the other three are, have been taken to the goal. Right? What we've been able to do is to use nonlinear control techniques to be able to define what this local divergence metrics might be of how stable a particular nonlinear dynamical system is to small perturbations in its state. So we have this notion called path divergence, and this system has high, this particular action has high path divergence. Of course, this is a local analysis, but it allows us to say, hey, you probably shouldn't take this action because it's, it has high divergence. So it's not very, very sensitive to perturbations in your initial conditions. Here's an example of a of an action that has low divergence. So here you see that all six of those objects are sort of overlaid on top of each other. And our algorithm is actually able to accurately predict this even without running any of these rollouts. So what our algorithm does is that it looks at the initial condition. It looks at the control action that you have. 
and it tries to predict whether you will have high or low divergence without running any rollouts whatsoever, because rollouts are expensive, right? These rollouts, running these rollouts is expensive. So one way you can incorporate path divergence is that you can say in your rollouts, have a threshold on divergence. Only accept motions that are low divergence. Don't accept any increase in uncertainty. So, uh, so here's an example of a motion that we would reject because it has high, high path divergence. Here's an example of a motion that you would accept because it has low path divergence. Now, this is really good, and it actually works really well. But one of the limitations of this is that it really is overly conservative. Sometimes when you are solving a manipulation problem, if you look at this white ball there, its uncertainty actually increased during the motion, right? Sometimes when you're trying to perform an action, you can't guarantee that you will always reduce divergence. Sometimes you need to increase divergence to then subsequently reduce it. And so our algorithm was unable to produce these motions that reduced path divergence, that increased path divergence and reduced them. And so what we did then, and I'm going to give you a very, very brief vignette into this, is describe the problem as an unobservable Monte Carlo planning problem where we're running what's called Monte Carlo tree search. Uh, what Monte Carlo tree search is able to do, and I won't go into the details of this, is that it's able to analyze the entire search in belief space by rolling out a tree. So again, it's still open loop, but it's open loop stable. It's able to hallucinate various branches. It's very much like how AlphaGo runs, except, except that it's running Monte Carlo tree search on an unobservable Markov decision process. And we're using very informed heuristics to be able to deal with uncertainty in an un unobservable way. And this uh, actually produces plants that will happily increase uncertainty for a little bit before reducing it, because you're growing the full belief tree out. right? And this actually works really, really well. Of course, this is more computationally expensive than only planning in state space, but it can potentially address your question of how does this stuff work when you're running open loop actions in sort of in the real world. So not only that, we've also done a bunch of stuff that I actually talked about in my previous talk that I gave here a few months ago that I'm not going to talk about, which is um, tactile state estimation, being able to estimate the posterior belief based on tactile data that you're getting. And this is actually a very interesting and hard low dimensional problem. And using that tactile state estimation, as you're pushing an object, you're feeling forces and you're feeling contacts on your fingertips. Can you actually close the feedback loop on that? Uh, we're, a we're able to do that by formulating it as a contact POMDP. So here's another example of something that I spoke about uh, the last talk I gave here, where you can actually solve this as a partially observable Markov decision process. Instead of an MDP, you're solving the full POMDP. You're solving it on the contact manifold that, and also on, with physics that is projected onto the table. So this is sort of a, a confluence of everything that I talked about coming together, not just to solve uh, a state space problem with physics, but to solve belief space problem with physics, to add uncertainty to that, to add contact sensing to that, and to project it onto the lower dimensional manifold. So when we do all of this, we get um, a system, like Peter mentioned, I, I really like building systems. This is one of the systems that uh, I built. I was a PI on the DARPA DRC, DARPA Robotics Challenge. Uh, this is our robot, uh, Chimp. And what Chimp is trying to do is to work with an operator who is providing sort of breadcrumbs for the motion and to open that valve, uh, turn that valve. And it's using not just the physics-based algorithms that we've developed, but also some compliant control algorithms that I didn't have time to talk about uh, to actually turn that valve. So we first execute everything in simulation, verify that it works, uh, and then we run it on the, on the real robot. So here it's actually running some compliant controllers to figure out how it's going to move and, and, and turn its valve. And then it executes on the, on the real system. So that's, that's the real chimp. Uh, that's executing its uh, its trajectories. This is kind of a fun robot to build also for me because um, we built this robot from scratch. It took us six months to build it. I, I, I wrote the kinematics for the for the two arms. Um, the two arms, uh, it's kind of funny, they're really beefy. Uh, one of the cool things about the arms is that they can turn into treads, so Chimp can go on, on all fours and drive like a, uh, like a tank. The other interesting thing is that DARPA initially told us that we, he, they wanted Chimp to climb a ladder vertically. And so I spec'd the arm such that it, the, each arm would be able to hold the entire weight of the robot. Uh, and then DARPA told us that there would be no ladder. Uh, <laughs> and so we spent about $500,000 more than we should have. 
uh, but he can climb a ladder if you ever give him a ladder. So I, I, I apologize for that. <laughs> Uh, but um, I promised I would talk about not just manipulation, uh, but also manipulation with and around people. So I want to sort of take a, a little detour and speak for the next 10 minutes about some of our algorithms for manipulating with and around people. Right? Um, one of the nice things about this is that uh, this sort of my own personal story is that I started looking at caregiving systems uh, right after when I got tenure because I was uh, I visited the University of um, of Chicago, and I also visited the Rehab Institute of Chicago as well as Kinova. And these are sort of wonderful robot arms that uh, our collaborators at Kinova make. Uh, there are six degrees of freedom, harmonic drive, um, series elastic actuators, uh, and they have continuous rotation. And one of the most important things is that they are FDA approved, so they're being used by over 300 people all over the world, mostly people with high spinal cord injuries, paraplegics, quadriplegics. Uh, using all kinds of interfaces. So this is really gorgeous about how, but what you don't see here is how hard it is to use these systems, right? So every single one of these robots is essentially a puppet, right? Uh, it's beautiful, six degrees of freedom, but it's being controlled by a very high latency, low bandwidth interface like a joystick. This person is actually controlling it with a joystick on their feet. They have MS. And so even for me, I worked on robots for 17 years now. Controlling these arms to do anything is really, really hard. Um, and what we were trying to do with Kinova is to try and see how we could take a lot of the autonomous algorithms that we've developed for robots like Herb and Chimp and try to make this robot not just a puppet in your hands, but really a caregiver that works with and around you. So that's sort of the, the goal of a lot of the work that we're doing is to take the autonomy that we've developed and sort of generalize that for a problem of shared autonomy, where the robot and the human are actually working together to solve the problem. At the first blush, uh, initially, my thought when I started working with uh, patients was to say, who cares about shared autonomy? Let's just make everything autonomous. And interestingly enough, uh, this is hard for two reasons. One is, just like it's almost impossible to make a fully autonomous car, so you take the steering, feel, steering wheel away, it's going to be really, really hard. But it may actually be possible and easier to have a system that is intelligent, that gives you assistance when you need it, right? And so I think that the barrier to entry for shared autonomy is much lower than the barrier to entry for full autonomy. The other problem, the other point I think was actually very, very illustrating is when I talked about this to the users, and these are people with high spinal cord injuries, they're often kids who have uh, been bungee jumping or skydiving and broken their spine and unable to move anything below their neck for the rest of their lives. And they said that uh, one of the kids actually made a very interesting point. He said, this arm is one of the few things in my life that I can control. And I don't want to lose control of that too. Right? So we often think that as roboticists, we can just go out there and auto automate everything. But imagine if you were sitting on a wheelchair and the wheelchair suddenly wheeled you somewhere, picked up some food, and tried to shove it in your mouth. Right? It would be bizarre. Right? Of course, you know, it's not going to be that bad. But really, I think it gives us pause to think a little bit about the paradigms that we want to use when we want to work with users. Right? As roboticists, we want to automate everything. But really, I think we have to think carefully about what users might like. So we decided to try and come up with an algorithm for shared autonomy. When you think about direct LA operation, you have a user input, and you're trying to uh, use an interface. This is a head-mounted joystick or a BCI interface to actually uh, you know, achieve your goal. And you move the, move the joystick around, and that moves the arm around. What we're trying to do is, of course, this is noisy. It has insufficient degrees of freedom. It can be really tedious. What we're trying to do is to inject the system in the middle of this. right? Imagine that the system is there. It's watching you move your joystick, and it's trying to help you try and solve your problem. And what the system is trying to do, what we're trying to do, is to simultaneously predict and assist. The system doesn't know which goals you're going after. It doesn't know whether you're going after this coffee mug or that other coffee mug. But what it does know is how to assist you when, when it knows your goal. Right? So the game we're playing is that the system has to simultaneously build a probability distribution over your goals and assist you in completing the task. So the latent state of the system is that it doesn't know what your goals are. And sort of traditional paradigms for doing this have involved sort of blending the user's input and the, and the robot's action. So the robot assists you when it's confidence of its prediction. 
The robot predicts which goal you're going after. If it knows well what goal you're going after, it'll assist you more. If it doesn't know, it'll assist you less. And this can be generalized to a lot of other paradigms. But our fundamental idea was that what if we jointly optimize the cost function of the user and the system? So the idea being, I don't know what goal you're going after, and I'm going to treat that as a latent state of a partially observable Markov decision process, a POMDP, and then create a cost function that simultaneously tries to predict what your goals are and assist you in doing them. So the system is both discovering and running little physics experiments on you to try and figure out which goal you're going after by sort of nudging you a little bit around, and it's trying to assist you in achieving that goal, right? So we have sort of a joint goal which says that I'm going to try to achieve the user's cost function. You model the user as a stochastic optimal controller, a rational agent who's trying to solve a problem. And then you also add a penalty that says that I don't want you to deviate far enough away from what the user's input is. You go from sort of predicting the goal and then assisting to sort of minimi maximizing, the mi maximizing the value or minimizing the expected cost of the probability distribution over the goal. So if I don't know what goals you're going after, I'm going to optimize you under expectation. So this is really powerful because one of the cool things that comes out of this is that let's say I want to go after one of those three targets far away. And I know that a single action, even though it doesn't reduce the probability or change the probability of any of the goals, it still gets me closer to all of the goals. The robot will take that action. Right? It'll take actions that reduce the cost of going towards all of the goals and then decide later on how to figure out how to extract the correct, correct distribution. So the framework is that we assume that uh, the human is running a Markov decision process. They're a stochastic optimal controller. And let's say they're going after that yellow block, and they're running an MDP, and those are the sort of value functions of the MDP. The robot is running a partially observable Markov decision process. It doesn't know which one of those three goals you're going after, but it has an MDP for each one of those three goals. It's ready to help you. It just doesn't know which one of these three fake people you are, really. right? And it, it runs a POMDP. So as it, uh, let's take an instance where it has sort of equal belief that it's in either one of these three goals, and it has a policy for each one of them, and ideally what it needs to be able to do is minimize the expected cost to the goal, right? This is what policy iteration does, is that want to find the policy that minimizes the expected cost to the goal. There's a cool trick that you can use called hindsight optimization that switches the min and the expectation. And when you switch the min and the expectation, you get a lower bound on the, the optimal value. This is actually really, really powerful because it's called determinization by hindsight. Essentially, you're turning um, a minimization over expected value into an expected va expectation over a minimization problem. It's just a standard search problem, right? You're turning a belief space planning problem into a set of search problems. And that gives you a lower bound on the actual value. And you can run it you know, very, very fast, almost analytically. And so what the robot does is that, and this is called hindsight optimization. So it says that I know that you're going to go with one third probability to each of these goals. I'm just going to blend the three of them together in such a way that I get a, a, a final policy that helps me get to each of these goals. And this policy is being updated in real time at 100 hertz. So we're running POMDP at 100 hertz that optimizes all of these policies together. So, um, and that's sort of hindsight optimization. One of the drawbacks of hindsight optimization, determinization by hindsight, means that you're giving up on exploration, right? You're saying that I'm turning a, 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 a value function learning problem into one of several search problems, and so you're not going to explore, right? So your algorithm will fundamentally uh, decide not to explore for exploitation, but that actually works out really well for manipulation problems because as the act of moving towards the object actually gathers information for you. So this is a, a trade-off that you have to deal with, sort of doing one-step exploration, but it actually works really well for us for real time. So what does this look like in the real world? So on this side is a policy that's sort of the state of the art that is trying to predict the best goal and try to move towards it. On the other side is sort of our hindsight optimization policy that actually blends all of these solutions together. And it actually works really, really well and also produces really natural motion. The other thing that's really interesting here is that this is actually a study that we did with uh, a patient with uh, a BCI, a brain-computer interface. This is actually uh, ECOG, which is a cortical implant where you drill a hole in a patient's skull. 
and then you insert an electrode into them, and we're controlling this robot arm using that BCI interface, uh, which is really cool. This is some joint work with Andy Schwartz at the University of Pittsburgh. And this is actually some, a study that we ran, an experiment that we ran with Sam Isley. He's, um, he invented the Klondike bar um, several years ago. Uh, he's also someone with a high spinal cord injury, and he's running our shared autonomy algorithms for sort of getting a tasty meal of marshmallows from that. He's uh, someone who has very, very limited upper mobility control. So I want to close up with uh, a couple of sort of observations. So uh, we ran these studies uh, with Kinova. This is Seb, who is um, uh, at Kinova. He's an employee of Kinova. And he's also running uh, our shared autonomy algorithm to pick up that phone uh, using his interface. What you see here is actually um, a camera that we mounted. It's a first-person vision camera. And you see a limitation of our work, right? Which is, even though the system is trying to assist him, it's actually getting in his way of being able to see the phone, right? The system has no idea that you need to look at the phone. And, and one of the things that we're doing right now is incorporating visibility optimization into this process. <coughs> Someone asked, can we add constraints into this problem? Absolutely, yes, we can. And we can add constraints like visibility into it. Um, so to wrap up um, this little vignette, uh, this is all part of a new center that uh, I've started it's called the Center for Assistive Robotics for Everyday Living. Uh, the idea is to build technology that can actually help people. I know there's a lot of people here at the University of Washington who are working on this and related work, so I'm excited to be able to uh, collaborate with folks here on it. But I think it's somewhat both sort of practical use of robotics in the real world, but also for me, I think a moral obligation for us to help people who actually need the assistance. Uh, and I'm really excited to be part of that. And like I said, I, told, I promised you that I'll talk about manipulation with the Naran people, and I gave you sort of a short overview of a couple of our projects. Fundamental to all of those is that I really like to build mathematical models of physical phenomena, whether it's pushing stuff or whether it's trying to understand how a robot should share autonomy with you. I think the nice thing here is that you can take a lot of interesting qualitative principles and turn them into graph search or optimal control. And in the end, sort of all of this is about manipulation. And I would like to thank my students. I promised my students that I would show them their, the videos of their work. So here's a, a montage that shows you all the videos of their work. If it plays, I hope it plays. Oh, there we go, it played. Uh, but these are all the things that I didn't talk about. I'm sorry about that. But come find me at any other time. I'd be happy to talk about all this stuff. And uh, thank you. Any questions? Josh. That's a good question. So it's running everything. So the question was, are we discretizing the state space or are we working in a full continuous space? So we are, um, there's no discretization happening, but the search is happening by, via discretization. So it's exploring all the state space. It is sampling. So asymptotically, it will explore the entire state space. But the rollouts are applied sort of batch, one batch at a time. So we're doing what's called incremental densification. So you plan at some resolution-ish, and then you increase the resolution. And asymptotically, you can get sort of the whole thing. But um, yeah, that's what we're doing. Yes, Emo. Oh, that's a great question. I know we had this conversation before, too, uh, about um, model predictive control and trajectory optimization over search-based methods. Um, so the rollouts uh, are in the order of milliseconds. The entire planning uh, happens in the order of seconds uh, for the open-loop planning. Uh, one of the things that I'm actually really, really interested in and uh, something that I'd love to talk to you about is to see if you can use the state space trajectories as initial conditions for trajectory optimization-based algorithms. So one of the interesting things about these state space trajectories is that even though they're not robust to uncertainty, you can plan the whole thing out in, in the order of a second or so. And it gives you a very good, potentially good seed for running some algorithm that can actually incorporate uncertainty and feedback. So when you said earlier that 
it doesn't have to be optimal. You, you could run for a second, stop, think for a second, run again. It, it's kind of annoying, but it becomes close loop. Absolutely. Yeah, you could do that. I, it's sort of the, 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 the trivial closed loopness, right? Um, the other thing that you gain um, with that is that quasi statics allows you to do that, right? So one of the assumptions I made, I told you the assumptions I made was that quasi statics means that the object stops moving as soon as you stop pushing it. Right, which means that at any moment, at any point in that trajectory, you could stop, and everything would stop. And then you could like look at the world, and then plan again, exactly like Imo said. Of course, you can't do that when you don't have quasi-statics. Right? If you have dynamics, for example, the universe is moving, and, and you can't stop the universe. But that's a, that's a very, very good point. We actually, for some of the videos that I didn't show, we do exactly that where we, we run it for a receding horizon, and then we pause, and we, we reevaluate the scenario, and then we plan again. That actually works reasonably well. And I think part of the reason why it works reasonably well is that there's some magic in this quasi-static assumption that we're making that essentially also says that the, you can bound the amount of uncertainty that an object can have. Right? An object can't go past the point you've pushed it. So it can't fly away. Right? So the uncertainty that it has is actually bounded by the motion of the robot. So one topic that comes up a lot these days, of course, deep learning. And like your colleague Abhinav Gupta, he showed, he showed a robot that could learn to pick up objects just by trying it for weeks and weeks and gazillion of times, and then just learn some deep controller or something like that, um, which some people say could be an alternative to the more like physics-based reasoning. Do you have any thoughts on the promise of that? Or? Absolutely. I, I think it, I mean, we talked about this even during the at length during the grad student meeting. Um, I think it's a, it's a great point. Um, I'd be the first to admit that the models of physics that we have are very approximate. right? And the other thing I would be the first to admit is that our robot has actually manipulated those objects maybe for six or seven hours now, and it really hasn't built a better model. So there definitely is already a great promise for being able to refine the models that you're using. One of the things that we're doing is actually using Gaussian process regression. Um, think about the physics models, at least the way I think about it is, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they're often really good, but then they're really terrible in some places. Right? So being completely data-driven and throwing everything away, I think, is challenging. But I think using them as a subjective prior, for example, the mean function in Gaussian process regression, I think holds great potential, especially when you're dealing with very, very large state spaces. Right? You're dealing with very, very large state spaces. And so getting the sample density that you need to do learning in these large state spaces is really hard. Right? And so being able to add as many subjective priors as possible is useful. Um, yeah, I think the, the other form of policy learning, a little bit like what predictive state representations do, um, and some of the value function learning algorithms do, right, is to say, um, let's not even bother learning dynamical systems. All we care about is going from control actions to the eventual goal, the reward that we care about. And <coughs> you can potentially learn a direct mapping from one to the other, like what predictive state representations do. Or you can use sort of deep model-based reinforcement learning algorithms, model-free reinforcement learning algorithms to directly learn a policy. Right? You, you have some complex policy space, or you have some complex value function, and you're directly learning it. I think there's a strong question there of how well do those generalize. I think there's power to them in that they can express complicated things, but there's a generalization question that I think is still open. All right. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.